Coming up next on Central Illinois World War II Stories, we'll feature an interview with Sparky Songer of Danville. The year was 1943 when Harold G. Songer, president and curator of the Vermilion County War Museum in Danville, was drafted into the U.S. Army. Harold, better known as Sparky, works here as a volunteer. He's a war veteran and lifelong military man committed to providing a place where both the young and old can learn or reflect on war history. Seldom does a day go by when Sparky doesn't recall the bloodiest days of World War II. Surrounded by war memorabilia and dressed in a jacket similar to the one he wore when the Battle of the Bulge broke on December 16, 1944, he recalls the final days of that surprise attack by the Germans in Belgium, deep in the Ardennes forest. When the Battle of the Bulge opened up, uh, they knocked out our division in three days' time. And uh, we fought until we ran out of everything, and Colonel Cavender came up in the morning of the 19th, and I remember it very well, and he asked us if we wanted to fight to the finish or surrender. Uh, we said we'd fight to the finish, because he had no communication from our headquarters. He didn't know what to do either. But uh, he said, destroy and tear up your uh, weapons. The rifle, you could pull it back and take the pin out of it and throw it away. But they were gas-loaded cylinder, and he had a clip that went up inside, I think eight or nine, ten shells in a clip. So you take the clip out and strip the shells out, throw them away in the clip, but a lot of the guys forgot about that one in the chamber already there, and uh, during frustration and everything, it'd take the, the end of the the barrel and slam it up against a tree, and when they did, uh, there was a, one hell of a commotion, screaming, and everything. Uh, they'd shoot themselves right through the stomach, not intentionally. Uh, they frustrated and, and uh, for, forgot about that one, and uh, so they were dropping. We were yelling. We just had about six weeks of infantry training before we went over. And, uh, but at two o'clock in the afternoon, my sergeant had just got killed right beside of me. And I hit the ground and I raised my head and the sniper hit a spoon I had in my pocket, which I have now, but this is not the jacket. This is the one that's in the museum here. But the spoon was in my pocket. Why I had it, I'll never know, uh, because I had nothing to eat with it. And we were just eating K rations at the time. Uh, but it bent the spoon, as you can see. That's where it hit. And the lead portion of the bullet dropped in my pocket. And uh, after we surrendered and the Germans uh, searched this whatnot. Uh, they took the lead portion of the bullet, uh, kept it, and gave me back the spoon. That's the only thing I had to eat with when we got in prison camp. After they marched us out of the woods and put us up in the barn lot for the night, we had to, we filled up a barn lot and we just stomped all night long trying to keep warm. Uh, so cold, my feet were so wet and so cold. Everybody was, it wasn't just me. But I found them. Uh, some fence had been partially tore down. And I was going to push it down and make a hammock, like a hammock, and get up on it and uh, stretch out and uh, get my feet out of the mud. And uh, I felt a gun next to my temple. And I looked over and some guard was screaming at me and probably called me every name in the book and uh, made me get down. So I did as told. But it dawned on me when I was cutting my grass one afternoon, that son of a buck saved my life. I could have laid there on that fence, froze to death, and never have known a thing about it. That's the way you go when you freeze. 
Next day, they marched us down to some rail line and uh, put us in boxcars. And then we traveled, I don't know, maybe a day or two or three. And uh, we had to work on railroad. Uh, they had a, uh, railroads were always being bombed and, and tore up. And they shipped in a bunch of railroad ties and uh, they wanted us to uh, stack them. And uh, in doing so, we had to walk to camp and uh, we had nothing for breakfast, had nothing for lunch. Uh, we got a little bowl of soup, hot soup, rutabaga soup uh, in the evening, and that was all. You slept with your clothes, you, the same clothes you worked in, you had no heat in the barracks, you had no running water, you had no facilities. Uh, you were fighting a lice day and night. Everybody had it. Uh, you had uh, frozen feet. Some was frostbitten so badly that they had to be removed. On Christmas Eve, they took us into Stalag 4B in the camp we was at. I had, you had to do exactly as they told you. Or they didn't particularly care where you lived or died. In my case, uh, a German guard who thought that I had taken his briefcase and possibly his sandwich, whatever he had in it, because I never knew where the briefcase was. I had nothing to do with it. But the Czech guard who was with him told him that uh, he had hit it, and they both laughed after beating me, uh, almost breaking my back. and. Uh, Need to say, I had to put my shoe on real fast and go back to work like the rest of them. And instead of three of us carrying a railroad tie, they made, dropped it down and made two of us carry a railroad tie. And uh, so, consequently, over the years, I've had four back operations and two fusions. So I, things don't go away. You live with them daily. And they put us on more trains. And while I was unloading my portion of the coal car, a German guard, he was down looking under these coal box cars. And I got down and I was looking. And the guards kept saying the fueler. So the other guard, he ran up, or where he could get a look at it. And I could see a figure in the porthole that looked like Hitler. After that, we were notified by our guards that the Russians were coming in, which we knew. They'd ask us if we had anything we want to send to the laundry, and they'd have it back to us that evening. They wanted to make us look clean and presentable. We were totally exhausted, and uh, they said we'd stay here in the barn tonight. And uh, we could hear the Russians coming in. They were dropping bombs. and, and uh, so the next morning, another fellow, and I always thought his name was Lamb from Mississippi, but I'm not sure. Him and I just opened up the barn door because we got up before everybody else, I guess, and uh, looked out on the hillside, and there was a young German officer there with his leather coat on and his uh, boots and hat, and he had a tripod with a pair of binoculars watching the Russians uh, blow up Dresden. and. Uh, we just walked over to him and uh, nonchalantly, and I said, uh, Marathon and Dossway, yeah, and that's much German as I remember. He says, yeah, about 140 miles. I said, a long way to Tipperary, isn't it? And I said, you speak English? Yes, I went to the University of Michigan, and I came over to visit my family, and I got drafted in it. And he said, just go through the woods. Don't get on the highway. And he says, uh, about 140 miles, good luck. and." Uh, Says, see you. So we just kept on walking, never giving a thought about a friends back there in the barn. 